Hi, hello, hope you're well. To start off, I want to say that I am a really big Phoebe Waller Bridge fan. I'm a big Fleabag fan, a big Killy E fan, and I'm also a really big Crashing fan. Rest in peace, Crashing, you deserved a season two. And with that, I can proudly say that I was on the Jonathan Bailey train long before Bridgerton. Also, having watched Crashing, I just know that he's going to be an excellent Fiero in the Wicked movie. Additionally, I've also started watching some of the Indiana Jones movies and prep for the new one because firstly, I think it's odd that I've not seen any of the Indiana Jones movies yet, but also because Phoebe Waller Bridge is in the new one and I love seeing her in things. So that's kind of what inspired the idea that this week I'm going to be reading some of Phoebe Waller Bridge's favourite books. <laughs> Firstly, we have Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulakov. Bulgakov. I actually don't know how to say it, but yeah, I don't know why that. Bulgakov, that's not that hard to say. I've heard this one before, but I've never really been super tempted to pick it up, but now I'm kind of interested to see what it's about. Also, I don't think I've actually ever read any like translated Russian fiction, which I think is something that needs to be rectified. So I think this is a good start for that. The book follows the story of the devil's visit to Moscow and his interactions with the literary elite of the city, and also the havoc that he kind of creates when he's around. One of my favourite like draws, the biggest draws that I have to this novel is that I love the cover. Loki, not really like this cover, just because the library did not give me the cover that I wanted, but I love the other cover. I'll put a picture of it. It's just like so beautiful, like it's hand drawn. Well, most things are hand drawn, but it's it's a gorgeous cover and I love it and I wish it. I had that one instead of this. Like what what even is this? Why is there a pig on the cover? The next book is Forever by Judy Bloom. This is a young adult novel about a teenager's first time having sex. It was published in 1975, so it's a bit risque for the time of release. Um, and I also watched a new film that's called Hey God, It's Me, Margaret, which is adapted from another Judy Bloom book. And I really liked it. So I feel like if the punchy but heartfelt tone of that story is also within this book, this could be sort of like a really lovely read. Plus the story that she tells, um, Phoebe tells about picking out this book and reading it was really funny. So I picked it out of her list of recommendations because it just seemed like perhaps it would give me an insight onto who she was. The last book will be The First Bad Man by Miranda July. This book's meant to be a little bit weird and absurd, so I'm kind of excited to see what that's about, but also a little frightened by some of the reviews. I say reviews, it's like comments on Goodreads. But this does feel like it would be one of Phoebe Waller-Bridge's favourite books, you know? Like, it just has that vibe. And um, so the novel is about a woman whose boss's daughter moves in with her, and the repercussions that sort of fall, unfold from that and so yeah, that's all of the books that I'm going to be reading and let's just see how this goes. A, you know, a Wikipedia binge of Phoebe Waller Bridge because, you know, reading her books, watching her stuff, I also rewatched an episode of Fleabag because like of course I did. Um, and like, I totally forgot that she was in Broadchurch. Like, I haven't watched Broadchurch, but like, I forgot that that was like one of the main things that made her famous, like, at the time. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like this is also sort of, kind of making me want to watch Broadchurch. So I never watched it, cause I, like, I feel like England and like the BBC just like bigs up any given like crime procedural drama because like they, 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 love, they love it they you know they eat it up it's all for like middle-aged people and like old people who watch like television that's like on my player you know you know the vibes and i never watched it but like everyone loves it especially because like it has a big cast i guess like there's like david Tennant who's already big and then like this was the reason olivia coleman also got big because this is like one of her bigger roles where she was sort of like getting acclaim for it but yeah, I'm much more interested in seeing it now. I don't know if I will, because I've also heard that the last season isn't very good. I also found out on this binge of like going through her Wikipedia that Chris Chibnall, the guy who was the showrunner for the last three seasons of Doctor Who, like the shit versions, like the one with Jodie Whittaker, which honestly was such an L considering like, I can't believe the first few World Doctor had such a bad showrunner that like the entire vibe is just like, they're probably never gonna give us a female Doctor again, are they? Like it was so bad. And I don't think she was that great. And also Jodie Whittaker is also in Broadchurch. And I'm like, so was she a nepotism hire for Doctor Who? That also has me spiraling. Cause I'm like, did they just pick her? Cause he knew her as in like Christian Chibnall, the showrunner knew who she was previously. And they were like, well, we know each other. It's like, why shouldn't she be? the new daughter and now i'm like maybe she wasn't the best choice anyway because i don't really like her daughter like regardless of whether or not i liked 
Chris Chibnall, with, which I don't, and I don't think he was very good, but yeah, everything really tying into each other. England is a small place where everyone knows each other. Tell me why I was like, okay, I'm gonna go to the gym today. I've like been slacking. I was meant to go three times this week, but I only went twice, okay? So I was like, let me just go. I said, I went once, this is my second time. I was like, let me go in my car, get there, go to the gym. And immediately I get into a car accident. Actually, that didn't happen. I went to the gym, it was all fine, okay? I did my running. I was like, this is a horrible fucking bullshit. I hate it, let's go back to the car. Let's go home, get into my car, reverse, hit someone's car. I'm like, immediately, I'm like, nothing good ever comes from me leaving my house, okay? Like, unless it's to get dressed up with my girls and go out to eat, nothing ever comes from going outside and, like, living my life. Like, I'm like, I should be a slug like this in my room forever. Because, oh my god, what do you mean I hit someone's fucking car? My insurance premium. It's gonna be so expensive. Right, so first time in my life i have taken a dub okay there is this hairstylist on tiktok that i've been following for like a couple months now okay and i think they make hair look incredible like they have this specific hairstyle that they always do that like i really want like it's like a it's like a shag but like a proper nice one and they make it like good for like everyone and i want it done on me okay especially since like my bags look how bad my, like, my bags are they're so long i don't like cutting them myself because i'm so bad at doing hair like i can't even like French braid, like I can plait my hair like really badly and I can't even do anything else. So I like literally always have my hair down and then my fringe like curled or something to make it look presentable. I don't do anything else. And I haven't even cut my fringe because I need to go all the way across London to get it cut at my old hairstylist. But this hairstylist, the one from TikTok, is 15 minutes away from my house. Like I could get there in 15 minutes. Like I have to just drive there for 15 minutes and they are there like and they're not even that expensive like because they don't like they're not in central they live there where i live i've never i've never taken a dub in this capacity before i feel adrenaline spiking through my veins in a way that doesn't happen if i'm not wasted this this might make up for the car accident another wikipedia binge of really all the bridge and she's she's dating martin mcdonough like everything i find out about this woman it just like blows my mind like what do you mean like martin mcdonough i don't know how to say his name again i'm having problems with names this video like the guy who directed like three billboards in bruges bad she's adventure in he was snubbed I love everything everywhere all at once, but he was snubbed for original screenplay, in my opinion. Everything else they should have won, but that one, that should have been yours, Martin. I believed in you. But like, what? Like, that makes sense. Like, they make sense together. Like, together as a couple, they make sense. And it, I feel like I keep thinking Phoebe Wallerbridge, even though it's a very English name, but she's kind of Irish. And I think it's just because, like, I associate her with, like, that brand of, like, Sally Rooney, Paul Mescal, you know, like, that vibe. She really fits in with that sort of, like, aesthetic. But she's not. But, you know, obviously, Martin McDonough is Irish. It's, it's all coming together. It, it's, it constantly seems to be coming together. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think Mary and Chris are siblings. <laughs> straight up, straight up. <laughs> okay, so like now we'll get down to the debrief of all the books that we read. This book was very strange, but in a good way. There's a lot of sort of strong magical realism in this. Going in, I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't expecting to read about Jesus so much. I got to the second chapter and I see the name Pontius Pilate and I spent a real while, in my opinion, trying to figure out where that's from and what 
character and book that could be from? What metatextual reference is Mikhail making here? And I come to realise that the book in contention is the Bible. Because like I see the name Yeshua and I'm pondering like, you know, suddenly and after that it kind of clicks. I'm like, the padlock up here sort of like unravels and it goes, oh my god, it's Jesus. Like Pontius Pilate is who killed Jesus. Then like the second chapter ends and the story continues in Soviet Russia instead of wherever Jesus was when he died. And then we move, you know, we move on from Jesus and then boom, guess who's back in another chapter? Jesus. Our boy Yesh was back. And of all the weird things that in my opinion happen in this book, the wilder jump scares are still the Jesus chapters. Like it's all Yeshua was doing this and Yeshua was doing that. And then suddenly Judas is here. I read online afterwards that this is because the author had a lot of like problems with the denial of like Jesus existing and religion within Soviet Russia. But in general, it's an odd interference with the actual plot. But I know that it's like part of the plot, but I'm just like, oh my God, like Jesus is here. It's odd. I feel like Jesus in any narrative is odd. The ongoing like A plot line of this book follows the devil or like Professor Woland as he's called in the book causing mayhem around Moscow by threatening and humiliating the citizens of the city by doing tricks of magic in front of people which cannot thereafter like be explained to the authorities. So lots of characters are institutionalised because people who didn't see the hijinks the devil did think that the devil's magic is like insane, like people who saw the magic is insane for believing that like there's a talking cat or that the professor like predicted the future or that he gave them clothes that like disappeared when they were wearing them out on the street. And many for that there is a love story between Master and Margarita. The Master is sort of a stand-in character for Bulgakov and his struggles with the Soviet censorship at the time. And Margarita is a woman who is in love with the master whilst she herself is in a passionless, loveless marriage to someone else. And although her character, in my opinion, feels a little brittle when you sort of explain it, she's the best part of the story for me. So the novel is split into two parts and she only enters into the second half and she is then quickly turned into a witch and she starts like wreaking havoc on the people who have like wronged her in her life. She's in my opinion really cuttingly funny and incredibly fascinating even when her main traits are like how pretty she is and how devoted she is to the master who in turn is a much more like solemn and restrained character. So in my opinion, Master and Margarita sort of like help to express the theme that runs throughout the novel, which is bravery versus cowardice and a general message that, you know, people should be brave. This is quite an implicit idea within this novel. Like many characters actually like say this, like they reiterate it throughout. And I assume that it's meant to be sort of like a middle finger to the Soviet establishment that the author wants to rebel against. And the idea is that, you know, he didn't want to have to conform to their censorship and beliefs when he was writing. And this novel overall feels that way. It also feels remarkably like a play, which I think would work as like a very compelling screwball comedy. It has a very like eccentric oddness that I feel like is usually reserved for the stage. And I think this is also kind of supported by the fact that this author was also a playwright. And like, I think there's this great idea that is kind of like explained on the back here where it's like, the master is the only one who can kind of resist the temptations of the devil because he's much more sort of like man devoted to the truth and that's the idea of like being against the censorship I think again the author is very political in like a in an odd way I think this is a very strange way to express that and that's exactly why I think it has a play vibe to it I think plays have a much more like odd way of expressing political themes that I think some books have, especially because it's a magical realism book. But yeah, it's a good book. I don't know if I'd pick up another of his books, but like it's definitely something that I will watch out for. Like if I like the sort of summary that I see of his other books, because I don't know, this is such an interesting summary, but like there are parts of it that go on, especially the Jesus chapters. The Jesus chapters are confusing. Forever, on the other hand, is a pretty flat book with sort of kind of one-dimensional characters. I think it does everything that it said that it could do on the tin. It follows the relationship from start to finish with the main characters deciding to have sex for the first time. And the most unique aspect of the novel was how the sexual element of the book is both the entire theme of the book that like the plot hinged on and yet it was also not a very sexy experience. Like it's not an erotic story at all. The book is much more about exploring a first time within a relationship and the idea of perhaps like waiting until you're ready, the feeling of being attracted to someone and like what that can mean more broadly, plus the general livelihood of teenagers, which I think is a good thing considering this is a YA book. This was like clearly written for a teenage girl audience, 
perhaps hinting at what to expect from their first time and how to handle the pressure about sex, having sex itself, jealousy, lack of experience and how to perhaps handle your family's reaction to your sexual activity and just like the pressure that can be derived from it too. However, even though sexual liberation and sort of like surety of like your sexual liberation is in the forefront, I do think the boyfriend in this book sort of does coerce Kath, who is the novel's main character, into having sex and like she eventually is just like fine with him afterwards throughout the story and does like actively want it, which I do think was like incredibly progressive for the time. Yet his like coercion is never this sort of sexy active persuasion, like it's much more about just like engaging in sex whenever he wanted to and then her just going with it, which seemed a little, you know, like to tell a teen girl audience that, it just felt like sort of saying coercion is okay, especially since that kind of behaviour is incredibly common with people who have sex with cis men, it seems like an odd thing to actually allow women to kind of think that's okay, especially teenage girls. I think the most interesting thing though that was discussed in this book is when you can really tell that a mother was writing this book and that is at the point where the mum goes, when you sort of step over the boundary of being sexually intimate with someone, you can't really come back from that. You don't go, oh, we can't anymore. This is both like on the, I don't know about this one, Judy, like kind of dubious consent here mainly because there's not so much nuance on that concept because again this is a YA book but also in a real way kind of true whilst you can say no to someone it would feel kind of awkward to constantly be like actually no I'm not ready let's not do that again instead of let's wait for me to be ready the first time like I understand the idea of promoting being able to say no in this scenario but also the more realistic perspective is that if you did have a bad experience at having sex with your partner, the next course of action wouldn't be to stop entirely, but to sort of talk about it so that it could be better next time, which in the end is what her like mum is implying. The book overall feels like a nice look into this world for teenage girls, but also like a novel that sort of doubles as an enlightening, maybe secret manual for those who are confused about it, which is what I think this book is meant to serve as its purpose. And lastly, the first bad man. I need to firstly introduce that a quarter of the way through this, I googled the author again and found out that Miranda July, the author, directed and wrote Kajillionaire, which is an excellent film, but also made the dominoes fall into place and made me go, oh, like the weirdness of this book makes sense. Like it's very reminiscent of her remarkable but offbeat movie. So I felt more settled into this book, imagining the book happening with this sort of same anxious and peculiar tone that the film Cajillionaire has. The protagonist of this book, Cheryl, is a single woman in her 40s who lives on her own and she is in love with a man who is in a relationship with a 16 year old girl. Cheryl works at a company that makes and sells self-defense videos which Klee's parents run and Klee is her lodger. So the book is very slow and not super invigorating until it changes and it kicks itself into gear at some point when Cheryl and her lodger Klee start physically fighting each other. So everything that happens in this book makes you go like, what the fuck, what the actual fuck is happening right now? Like everything starts folding from the second they start fighting and it just becomes an absurdist, sort of uncomfortably funny narrative from that point forward. This book is very sexual in a way that I don't think James A. Carter's guide to quitting social media isn't. However, I read that book recently and those, this book and that book feels like kindred brethren in the way that they have nonsense outlandish plot lines the book like really makes me remember how weird fiction can be at the end of the day you know you can write down whatever you want into a story as long as it's entertaining also in the vein of like being as weird as you can be i can't believe miranda july has given the world two of the strangest lesbian couples to ever grace media her mind is simply built different and i can only hope that some of her irreverence can rub off on the way that I make media and just write the way that I think it definitely has on the way Phoebe Waller-Bridge probably writes her own work. None of Phoebe Waller-Bridge's work is as crazy or as off-putting as this book was, but I do think that they share the same achingly cringeworthy quality through their like lack of moments of peaceful respite in the narrative. I also found out that after reading this book that she is married, Miranda July, to Mike Mills who made 20th Century Women and Come On Come On, which made me realise that the entire sort of idiosyncratic abnormal world of writers are kind of close to each other and connected in a way, like they all sort of influence each other through the beliefs that they put into their own media and there's like a real large pool of like directors and writers 
that kind of make provocative work that I think are really setting the tone of like what the 2010s and like the art movements of the 2010s were really like and perhaps even what the art movements will be sort of like leaking into the 2020s as these people kind of keep writing and making art. From reading these books I think you can gather that the clarity of the sexual themes in Forever felt like it would intrigue someone like Vivi Littlebridge to the point where I think the novel has stayed with her into her adulthood from like when she read it as a teenager or whatever. And with Monster Margarita I really do understand why she likes this so much. It's filled with a sort of brazen bizarreness that I think can be found in her own work. I think Roland, who the devil is pretending to be, also kind of reminds me of Villanelle. So I can kind of see this kind of subconsciously inspiring the character of And with Master Margarita, I really do understand why she likes it so much. It's filled with this sort of brazen bizarreness that I think can be found in her own work. Roland, who is who the devil is pretending to be in this novel, also really reminds me of Villanelle. So I can see why this perhaps subconsciously inspires her characterization of a villain, like Villanelle's pension, penchant, whatever, for finery and excellence and elegance are all qualities Roland has of sort of like a kooky evil trickster character they both kind of possess that vibe all of her favorite books that i read do in my opinion fit into the mold of her at least you know public persona if not her real self and i can see these works in her own projects in a very positive way and whilst i wouldn't perhaps search out these books i'm definitely left with a sense of like wonder about all of them and i'm especially interested in some of miranda july's other works so her book, Nobody Belongs Here More Than You, was actually already on my read list before this was. And I'm much more jazzed to read that now. And also her film, Me and You and Everyone Else, which I had not heard before, is much more in my brain as a to watch. Especially in my opinion, because the cinematography of that movie looks incredible. But yeah, I'm really glad I read these. I liked that reading them has left me with more media to consume than I started with. And I'm very excited to see what Phoebe Waller-Bridge does next in terms of writing, especially since I've not heard too positive things about the new Indiana Jones movie since starting to make this video. Nearly nothing, actually, that she's in that she didn't actually write is that good, which seems like both a curse and an incredible blessing, like, since it helps with the public realising how good her own talent is, like how great, amazing and spectacular her writing is, but perhaps also how bad she is at picking acting projects. But yeah, thank you for watching, have a great day and take care.